So little Johnny was a mischievous young boy who was known for his quick win and clever comebacks. One day as a mailman was walking down the street, he saw little Johnny playing in a pile of shit. The mailman was horrified to see the boy had it between his fingers and smeared over his body. The mailman asked him what he was doing, and Johnny looked up and said, making a mailman. This comment irritated the mailman, and he went up the street looking for someone to vent his frustration. He saw a fireman and told him what the boy was doing and how the kid was a smart ass. The fireman said that he would have a talk with the boy. The fireman walked up to little Johnny and asked him what he was doing playing in pile of shit. Johnny looked up and said, making a fireman. This comment also angered the firefighters, and he left to tell a passing lawyer about it. The lawyer said that he would have a talk with the boy. The lawyer asked little Johnny, what are you doing playing with a pile of shit? Little Johnny looked up and said, nothing. The lawyer said, I know what you said to the mailman and the fireman, so why didn't you tell me that you are making a lawyer? Little Johnny looked up and said, because I ain't got enough shit. A young couple was getting ready to give birth to their first child, and they had determined that the child should not be named until after it was born, so that they could meet it and make the name based on that first magical moment. On the day of the birth, a beautiful baby girl was born, and the parents were instantly smitten. It's love, said the mother. All I can think when I gaze on this precious child is love. That needs to be her name. The father was not on board. We can't name her Love. That sort of name will cause a world of problems for her down the road. How about a Jessica or a Jane? And the two parents fought. During a break in the fighting, the father went out to go to the bathroom, during which time a nurse came into the room and the mother added the name Love to the birth certificate. When the dad learned about this, he was upset, but he couldn't do anything about it. Resigned, he reasoned that he would love his daughter regardless of the name. The first few years of the child's life were pure bliss. However, she came home from her first day of kindergarten with tears streaming down her cheeks. When the parents asked what was wrong, Love said through her sobs, the, the other kids at school, they, sniff, they wouldn't st stop laughing at my name, breaks down. The mother and father did their best to console Love, telling her that things would change over time. But they didn't change for the better. The classmates only became more cruel with time. The taunting became merciless throughout elementary school, with junior high becoming unbearable. Love's grades suffered, and she withdrew into isolation. High school was hell on earth for the girl with the clickishness of high school bearing down on her every sad day of her life. One night, as dinner was being prepared, Love came into the kitchen, silently placed a sad kiss on her father's forehead, cast a piercing glare at her mother, and walked back to her room, while the puzzled parents were looking at each other, as if to say, what was that all about? They heard a terrible noise from Love's room, a loud blam, followed by a thudding to the floor. As they feared, they raced into Love's room to see the teenager clutching a pistol in her hand, with the self-inflicted wound pumping blood out of her chest. Following a brief period of denial, where they couldn't accept what was unfolding, anger set in for the father. He bitterly turned to his wife and yelled at her, Shot through the heart, and you're to blame. Darling, you gave Love a bad name. <laughs> Three people die and appear before Buddha. Stunned by the divine presence before them, they lower their heads. Raise your heads. You are humble in life, and your deeds were praiseworthy. You have earned the right to a reincarnation of your choice. You have much to accomplish yet, though. One of the people takes a step forward and speaks, seemingly troubled. Benevolent Buddha, what more could I possibly do in my next life? I thought I lived and acted to the fullest. Because of my work, almost the entirety of the Earth's population will never starve. My work was also to the extent of my abilities, says the second one. Right now, 
the world I leave behind enters a revolutionary era where medicines can cure anything. Such was my contribution. My connections in life pushed all countries into an agreement of indefinite world peace, says the third person. I know all of your actions well, but that is still not enough. Here, let me show you a true example of someone who achieved everything that I ask for. They are waiting for the perfect reincarnation. The three people now both curious and excited follow Buddha to a small building. Their jaws drop when they find just an ordinary person inside. So ordinary that not even a small detail on that person sparks the tiniest interest. Before the Buddha can say anything else, they all rush towards him. Impossible, yells the first person. Such a plain human being, you. What was your work during your earthly life? Who? M me? I only had two part-time jobs. Nothing else that I can remember. During the morning hours, I worked in a small plantation. Fruits and vegetables. You're joking, shouts the second person. And the second job? Oh, that one was a bit odd. My village had a signboard where people would post their ads, job offers, etc. But because the signboard was old, those would sometimes come off. My job was to put them back in their place. This is preposterous, yells the third person. How could you possibly have amassed such an amount of karma with just those two insignificant jobs of yours? Well, I don't know what to tell you, but I've really done nothing else, just farming and reposting. <laughs> One day, while he was at the track playing the ponies and all but losing his shirt, Mitch noticed a priest who stepped out onto the track and blessed the forehead of one of the horses lining up for the fourth race. Lo and behold, that horse, a very long shot, won the race. Before the next race, as the horses began lining up, Mitch watched with interest the old priest step onto the track. Sure enough, as the fifth race horses came to the starting gate, the priest made a blessing on the forehead of one of the horses. Mitch made a beeline for a betting window and placed a small bet on the horse. Again, even though it was another long shot, the horse the priest had blessed won the race. Mitch collected his winnings and anxiously waited to see which horse the priest would bless for the sixth race. The priest again blessed a horse. Mitch bet big on it, and it won. Mitch was elated. As the races continued, the priest kept blessing long shot horses, and each one ended up coming in first. By and by, Mitch was pulling in some serious money. By the last race, he knew his wildest dreams were going to come true. He made a quick dash to the ATM, withdrew all his savings, and awaited the priest's blessing that would tell him which horse to bet on. True to his pattern, the priest stepped onto the track for the last race and blessed the forehead of an old nag that was the longest shot of the day. Mitch also observed the priest blessing the eyes, ears, and hooves of the old nag. Mitch knew he had a winner and bet every cent he owned on the old nag. He then watched dumbfounded as the old nag come. In dead last, Mitch, in a state of shock, made his way down to the track area where the priest was. Confronting the old priest, he demanded, Father, what happened? All day long you blessed horses and they all won. Then in the last race, the horse you blessed lost by a Kentucky mile. Now thanks to you, I've lost every cent of my savings. All of it. The priest nodded wisely and with sympathy. Son, he said, that's the problem with most people. You can't tell the difference between a simple blessing and last rites. <laughs> my friends, if you want to watch other funny jokes, subscribe to the channel.